morning, everybody. How's it going? Yeah. Happy Mother's Day to all the moms. Yeah. Yeah. We love it. Well, let's uh, let's stand and worship Jesus because He's awesome. Welcome your presence, God. You are worthy of our praise. You are worthy of our adoration. And you're worthy of our worship this morning, God. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Let the King of Mark be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, and know He is my song. Let the King of Mark be the shadow where I the ransom for my life, and know He is my song. sing you are good, because you are good.
friends in Colorado that uh, I bought. And on the back it says, where we walk, the desert's blue. And I just want to declare that over you today. Where you walk, the desert's blue. Where you walk, dry things blue. Where you walk, dead things blue. And not just because of you, but because of who's in you. That when he encounters dead things, they bloom. So come Holy Spirit, I pray that dead things would bloom. Beauty would be given for ashes. I pray joy for mourning today. where he walks. Dead things bloom. Deserts bloom. Dry things bloom. Come, Lord Jesus.
praise, God. You are worthy of our adoration. You are worthy of all that we have, God, it's yours. All that we have, it's yours, God. And no, it's not much. But as the song Gratitude says, I've got nothing else fit for a king. All that we have is yours today, God. Thank you, Jesus, for being who you are. Thank you, Jesus, for your presence today. Yeah. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Turn around and say happy Mother's Day to all the women that you see around you. Encourage them, bless them. Teenagers, stay in here for a little bit longer. We're going to do something that involves you before you guys leave today. So just hang out with us if you are in 6th or 8th grade for a little bit longer before we get into things this afternoon and this morning. Well, good morning, friends. Uh, my name is Adam Waters. All of my wife, Corey, we are the lead pastors here of the Bloomington Normal Vineyard. Uh, we're excited you're here on this Mother's Day. Uh, we love to celebrate uh, the women in our church. We love to celebrate the moms and grandmas. Uh, the great grandmas in our church. Um, what a fantastic uh, day to be alive. Uh, hug those that you know, celebrate them, encourage them today, uh, the women in your life and things like that. Uh, to do some of that today, there is a special place out in the lobby, you may have noticed on your way in, uh, where you can go and take uh, a selfie with your family or uh, with your mom, or just take a beautiful picture of your mom um, and celebrate her and post her on your socials and tell everybody how amazing they are. Um, uh, if you are newer with us today, you've never filled one out before, would you do us the honor of filling out a Connect card this morning? You can do that a couple of different ways. Scan that QR code on the seat back that's probably right in front of you or just to the side of you. Uh, go and follow the Connect With Us instructions there. That's a great way to sign up for small groups, to ask us questions about the church, to give us prayer concerns, uh, to sign up for our next baptisms, um, all those kinds of things, which are just in a couple of weeks. Uh, we're doing an extra baptism here in May. So if you have any questions about baptism, come and see me after the service. I'd love to talk to you about making that a special day for you all. Uh, mostly inspired uh, those baptisms by our teenagers. Um, and uh, they are part of what we're going to do here before we dismiss them to their, uh, the, the middle schoolers to their normal um, uh, small group discussion. We want to do something special today um, in that, uh, I think it was yesterday, was the official ISU graduation. Um, we've had other graduations. We have things ending. We have more, like high school graduations are still coming up and things like that. Uh, but what we want to do as a church family um, is do a couple of minutes of just praying over those that are moving from one stage of life into the next stage of life. Um, uh, I know they've already done something special at youth group uh, already for our students and things like that, but uh, there are other graduates that are going to happen here as well. So, let, so let's do this. If you are in eighth grade, if you are a senior in high school, if you are an intern with this church, or you graduated from any level of college, be that you know bachelor's, associate's, master's degree, PhD, would you stand up for us real quick? Just if you graduated from anything in the last, and, or you're coming about ready to graduate, so that would include you, Z. Uh, uh, anybody else? I can do that, it's my son. Um, so anyway, oh, Chuck in the back as well. So um, there was some, of, some of you are gonna have to find Chuck back there standing up. So we, first of all, let's give these guys a round of applause. And then we're gonna do If you know them or if you're near them, would you go and lay a hand on them? Um, and we're going to pray over them, okay? Because the best thing we can give as a church is encouragement, is uh, an extra dose of God's love and, and good news uh, on them. A couple of you guys get Chuck back there in the booth. Okay, good. Um, so, yeah. So we got, a, we got a PhD, we got a master's, we got high school graduates, we got intern graduates. We got like it all going on today. All right, this is like every level in this service. Okay. So let's pray over these guys. Father, in Jesus' mighty, amazing name, uh, we bless each of these people. I'm going to come help pray over here. Uh, we bless each of these amazing people with your heart, with your love, with your grace. God, they have finished one thing, but they're on to the next. And we know that you're always doing new things, God. You're always bringing new blessings and new life and new encouragement into people's lives. So as they finish one chapter... God, may they know that you're not finished with them yet, but you've got something new for them in their new season. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. 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 Let's, pray, let's clap for them one more time. Six to eight graders, if you want to go to your small group, you can. Uh, thank you guys so much for honoring them this morning, for encouraging them this morning uh, uh, as we wrap up. It's May, guys. It's all the things, right? Graduations. Um, uh, the end of the school year, Mother's Day, um, 
make sure again you take pictures, go to the popcorn bar after service, all those kinds of things. Um, celebrate your moms well today. Remember them well. Give them a text or a phone call, whatever, uh, today. One other announcement um, that I have for you all this morning. Um, our worship teams are also uh, seeing a transition happen. We talked about this transition back in January. Um, but uh, Chuck Hill, who has been our worship pastor for the last six years or so, um, is transitioning and turning over to Tyler, who was leading worship this morning. And so they have a gathering on the 31st. Um, I'm not even sure what day of the week that is. I think it's like a Friday. Is it a Friday? Oh, sweet. It's on a slide. Just look at the slide, Adam. Good night. <laughs> um, uh, the, they're going to have a worship gathering, um, and so see one of the worship, other worship leaders, um, see one of the worship pastors, and talk with them um, as they do their transition. If you're interested in worship, I'm guessing um, that would be a great thing for you to come to as well, um, for those of you that maybe are interested in being a part of the worship teams and the tech teams. That involves not just the people that are on stage, but those that are behind the scenes, um, doing slides, doing sound, doing all those things as well. So make sure, if you want to be a part of that, that you get that on your calendar as that is the end of their kind of school year as well. Okay, um, one last thing for me, uh, our giving moment today. Um, we have had uh, just a tremendous year. If you don't know, like the church's budget here goes from June to June. So we're about at the end of our year. I know that might seem strange to some of you. It's just around here, it's hard to do the end of the budget year at Christmas time because we're really busy in the church world at Christmas time. So our budget year goes June to June. Uh, we just had a great year. We've had an encouraging year, an uplifting year. Um, and we want to say, as we always do, thank you to all of you who have contributed of your time, your talents, and your treasure to make this a special place uh, to be a part of. And as we wrap up the year, um, we're looking into the future uh, about what God is doing here in our church. Um, and one of the things I just want to highlight and celebrate is a few weeks, weekends ago, um, our uh, missionaries to Mexico, um, Stephen and Anna Price, uh, are getting and gearing up uh, to go to Guadalajara. Uh, and if you're a part of their, their newsletters and their missions things, you know that they are... Um, they're doing some great things in terms of God has like opened the door for like a, a building already for them even before they move back down there. And so I just want to let you know that as you contribute to this place, you're contributing to planting and starting another church in Guadalajara. Um, and some of your money goes to helping them build that new building. And so we're very excited about what God's going to do through that. We actually have some some things we're going to announce about that uh, probably in the next couple of months as well. So it's really, it's really cool um, what God is doing, not only here in Louisiana Normal, but really around the world. Let me pray over our offering and then I'll tell you guys how we can give. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for what you're doing here in this place. Um, as you're leading and growing and building us up, we thank you for encouraging this place through children's ministry, youth ministry, outreach, through our weekend messages and services. God, you just keep, keep building and keep encouraging and it seems like you're always doing something new and we're so blessed by that. And we even thank you, God, for what you're doing through our church planting efforts both in Mexico and in South Carolina, God. You are building your kingdom in new and mighty ways all the time. And I just thank you, God, for the people in this room who give and contribute to this place. I thank you for those that are going to come next service that contribute to this place. I thank you for those that watch online every weekend that contribute to this place. You are building something amazing, and we get to partner with you. And thank you for that, Jesus. Amen. 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 A couple of different ways you guys can give. The easiest way, again, is to scan that QR code on the seat backs in front of you. I know many of you give online. Thank you guys for doing that. There are also some physical boxes on your way out of the auditorium and one out in the lobby uh, near that photo booth if you guys want to give physically today. Okay. Um, since it is Mother's Day, before our speaker comes up and gives us an amazing message, would you turn your attention to the screen for about a 90-second, two-minute video um, about our moms? almost everything. <laughs> I'm 16 years old and my mom doesn't know anything. <laughs> I'm 23 years old and I know way more than my mom. I'm 30 years old and I'm finding out that my mom might know something after all. <laughs> I'm 40 years old and my mom she worked harder than I ever knew. I'm 50 years old, and I'm seeing that my mom always 
tried her best, whether or not I recognized it at the time. At my age, there isn't a day that goes by when I don't wish I could just pick up the phone and call my mom to talk about, well, everything. To all moms, no matter what season you're in, may God fill this day with joy, with love, experience of his pleasure over you. Happy Mother's Day. All right, I'm not crying. <laughs> that video kind of hits. <laughs> All right, compose ourselves now. Uh, let's pray. <laughs> oh, Jesus, thank you so much. Thank you for Thank you for everything. Yeah. Mm, Holy Spirit, just come today. Come and speak to us. Whatever you want to say, Lord, we're here. Amen. Amen. All right. See, I, I really am crying. Okay. Oh. Like, stop it. Like, my, you started it. Like, we're going to cry. Okay. Um, let's do something fun. <laughs> I thought it would be really fun to start with some memes today, right? Because, yes. you know, like, what's, memes are fun. So I, I've assembled a few. Okay, so if anybody remembers the show Seinfeld, you were a Seinfeld fan, you'll like this first one, which is lack of humility, no soup for you. <laughs> for the social media lovers in the room, if you're somebody who spent a lot of time on Facebook, you'll appreciate this. I don't always humble brag, but when I do, I do it on Facebook. <laughs> For any math nerds, I mean math lovers in the room, why was the equal sign so humble? He knew he wasn't greater or less than anyone else. <laughs> now, if you're a Bible scholar, you'll get a kick out of this one. Moses was more humble than any other person on earth. Moses. <laughs> That's a nod to Numbers 12.3, which, you know, some people say Moses wrote. Anyway, uh, for the teenagers in the room, I got one for you, so pay attention, guys. I'm still waiting for the day when my parents say, it's all fake. We are millionaires. This was just to teach you how to be humble. <laughs> and, of course, a couple for the moms in the room on this Mother's Day. I decide what we wear, what we eat, and what kind of toilet paper we use. I try not to let all the power go to my head. <laughs> and of course, this last one. Humble mom claims she doesn't want anything for Mother's Day. Family calls bluff and buys gifts anyway. <laughs> Can you relate to any of these? I, I mean, there's a few of them, I think. Like, we've all seen the social media posts, the humble brags, right? Like, you know the ones I'm talking about. Or maybe you've made them, like, right? We do that. We do, I like to brag on Facebook a little bit as a parent. Like, I definitely like to be like, look at my kid. Like, this week it's been all about, like, Micah, because he's had, like, all the things. Um, <laughs> um, all the end of the year things. And, you know, especially with some of you graduating, like, hey, parents love to give the recognition on Facebook. We love to say, look at our kid. It's fun. So we like to show off the good things in life, right? And of course moms, you know, going back to the Mother's Day thing, don't we all kind of do the thing? We're like, no, no, we don't want anything. It's fine. But we do like the recognition a little bit, right? Even if we say we don't want something, we usually do want something. Even if it's not like a gift, we want the time or the affirmation from our families. You know, something like that. I mean, that's how I feel. And I think it's probably, you know, I've probably said or done things in the past. No, no, I don't want anything. Don't make a big deal. Now I feel like I usually mean it. Like, no, I don't need a big deal. Here's exactly what I want. I don't want to cook. I don't want to do a lot of stuff. Just, you know, like, sit me outside with a glass of iced tea and make dinner and I'm, I'm gold. <laughs> but we all like to be recognized at times, right? We all do things or say things or whatever. Like, we enjoy the recognition for our accomplishments, for our hard work, or just for being a parent, some, right? Like, we're celebrating Mother's Day with that. Like, and that's biblical. Like, God says, honor your mother and father, right? <coughs> we like the recognition, and that's okay. Recognition is a great thing. It's an important thing. But, I mean, that's why, that's why we're doing all this today, because it is important to recognize people and the things that we do in life. 
But there's a difference between recognizing someone and, of course, recognizing yourself a little too much, right? We live in a world where achievement and recognition are actually really like a big thing. They're important. And the more you can do, and the more you can be seen, and the more accomplishments you have, the more attention you get, right? Like it starts when we're young, the grades we make in school, um, the sports that we do, like how great of an athlete we are, uh, all our activities, our higher ed degrees, like yes, those are great things, you know, but all of these things, even though like it is fine to achieve them, as long as you're achieving them for the right reasons. See, as Christians, we need to make sure that our achievements are actually coming from a place um, that's healthy, a place of walking out our unique and God-given identities and abilities. We need to go into everything that we do with the understanding that humility is actually greater than recognition. <clears throat> humility is greater than recognition. Is that an uncomfortable statement for you? Is that something you've ever given much thought to? Maybe not. I mean, humility is greater than recognition. And when we live with healthy humility, it actually just means we're submitting to the authority of Jesus in our lives. We just recently wrapped up a series called The Repair Man. And in that series, we like identified all these ways that Jesus came, all these things that he came to fix and heal in our lives. So now as we are unpacking Luke 14, we get to find out how humility is one of those most important tools that we carry with us to allow the repairman to come in and do his job. Because if we don't have it, he can't come do his job. <laughs> so last week, Adam opened up at the first part of the chapter and talked about Jesus having dinner at the home of a Pharisee and healing someone on the Sabbath, which was a really big deal, but he was teaching them that even on our days of rest, we keep our eyes open to do the Father's will. And so today, as we continue on in Luke 14, Jesus gives out a little more friendly advice. So we're going to pick up in verse 7. When he noticed how guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor. For a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, Give the person your seat. Then, humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to you, Friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all other guests. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Then Jesus said to the host, When you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers, your sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, so you'll be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. So, this is two-part advice, right? To the guests. It's, hey, stop acting like you're better than everyone else, because you're not. <laughs> Don't put yourself in the position of honor, because you're going to look silly. <laughs> to the host, it's a message of, hey, it's easy to invite people over when they're your friends or when you're close, you know, when you have that kind of relationship. And, let's face it, when they can do something for you. Don't forget to care about the people who can't repay you for what you have. It's solid advice, right? Because you, you do. You look foolish when you try to make yourself look more important than you actually are. Right? Yeah. You look foolish. But that's the way of the world, too. God's people are supposed to be different, though. The Pharisees were supposed to be different. They weren't supposed to, to be ex. Weren't supposed to be acting like that. They knew the laws of their faith inside and out. They knew exactly what they were supposed to do. They were supposed to be these teachers and these people that, that could be trusted. But instead, they used it as a tool to gain wealth and status. That was what they cared about most of all. It wasn't God's people. It wasn't leading God's people. They cared about themselves. And when they hosted gatherings or dinners, it was most likely for political purpose, to make themselves appear great, to 
to gain favor with other people, to uh, just have that high status or keep earning the approval of others, right? It wasn't about just a genuine, like, let's be a community. It was about, nope, what can I get out of this? It was networking constantly. <laughs> The Pharisees here were so self-involved that in reality, they didn't understand who they had sitting at their table. They had Jesus sitting at their table. They watched him heal people. They heard his teachings. They knew he was different. But they were so caught up in themselves that instead of feeling the freedom of what Jesus was bringing, they felt threatened. That's not how you're supposed to feel when Jesus is around. You don't need to feel threatened. But this is what it's like in a world without God. Yeah. This is, this is the difference. The world without God will tell you to make a name for yourself, to fight for yourself, to care only about yourself, and maybe, just maybe, those who are closest to you, mm. if they deserve it. Right? Okay. It tells you that pride is going to be your biggest tool, not humility. Mm. And it's easy for some of us to think, hey, Sure, Jesus, that's great advice. Like, we're all sitting in church today. You know, here we are listening to a sermon. Yeah, of course Jesus is going to tell the Pharisees. Because we all know they weren't nice people. That's, that's common now. We know they weren't good. They really needed to be taught a lesson. Jesus, Jesus taught them a lesson. They were acting too much like the world. But hey, we're different, right? Are we all different here today? I'm guessing that's kind of what the disciples thought, too. <laughs> I mean... They were with Jesus. Jesus, I mean, many of them, he called from their own humble beginnings, right? Like, they weren't the most popular kids in the school. So why is it that then, a few chapters later in Luke, Jesus has to correct them too? Right? <laughs> in Luke 22, it says, well, so in Luke 22, Jesus was telling his disciples, um, hey, one of you is going to betray me. So what is that? Sorry. Oh, no, it's not me. I would never do that. No, no, who's it going to be? And they're pointing the finger and they're trying to decide. And then, in verse 24, this happens. A dispute also arose among them as to which one of them would be considered the greatest. I mean, do you sit around with your friends deciding which one of you is the greatest? <laughs> Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lorded over them. And those who exercise authority over themselves call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. Mm -hmm. So here he is again, correcting the people that are closest to him. It's not just the Pharisees. It's the people he's trying to like. It's everybody. <laughs> so if we don't live out of true humility, we won't look different than the rest of the world. And Jesus is trying to tell us, you need to look different than the rest of the world. This is something we all have to get. And here in these chapters, what's so interesting to me is that it's not the world he's talking to about this, right? It's the church leaders. Yeah. We are the church. The church leaders, the people. I mean, we think of this today, right? Like, you can think of your favorite celebrities or athletes or, you know, anybody in a position of, like, you know, that's famous. And, you know, you might, like, find all this good stuff about them, you know, oh, I love Taylor Swift, or I don't know, well, whoever, insert your favorite celebrity there. But at some point, they fall off their pedestal, right? Something happens, something comes out, and it's like, okay, maybe they're not so great. Even worse, when we think of the many church leaders in the world, the people that have large platforms, large followings, they write books, they give sermons, they inspire us to be better, only then to be exposed for their own moral failings. And it's heartbreaking. It's like, what happened? I love that book that this guy wrote. I love that sermon that he preached. There's no way that could have happened. The church needs to look different than the rest of the world. Otherwise, it becomes, instead of about pointing people to Jesus, we end up pointing them to ourselves. Right, right. And that's where we fall off the horse, right? Yeah. That's where we fall off our platforms. And why? I mean, you cannot serve God without humility. You can't. It doesn't work. You have to be humble. Because, 
I mean, Jesus tells us, you cannot serve two masters. Yeah. In Matthew 6, he tells us that. You cannot serve two masters. You will love one, you will hate the other. You cannot serve two masters. Now there he said you cannot serve God and money, right? And you can't. You can't love money and love God. You can't love two things. You're always going to love something, you're going to hate the other. But what is he saying here? What's the bigger picture? It's, you know, yes, wealth and status, of course, is a thing. But the bigger picture is that you cannot serve God and serve yourself. Right? Yeah. There's not going to be two gods. <laughs> now, we don't often call ourselves gods. But the reality is, when we think more of ourselves, you, you can't be a god. People have tried. Right? Like, there's a lot of, like, false idols. There's a lot of stories of, like, worshiping other gods. But here's the thing. One God is always going to win. Yeah. One God wins. And our God is already one. Yes. Our God is one. The Bible tells us he is already one. So when we say yes to Jesus, it says that we die to ourselves. We become this new creation. We become one with the Holy Spirit. And this is why humility is the strongest tool for us. The strongest thing we can use. Because to live in humility means to live in the amazing presence of God. It means that we're not trying to be God. Mm -hmm. It means that we live reliant on God. Good. And submitting to his authority is better than trying to do it ourselves. So how do we do this? How do we live this out? How do we look different? Well, I think healthy humility sometimes starts with mindfulness. That's tuning in to the things of God regularly, being in relationship with Him constantly, being willing to have hard conversations with Him, right? If you happen to be here last Sunday night um, for Holy Spirit Night, Carolyn Yoder was here and she kind of talked about this. Having hard conversations with God, being willing to let Him speak into your life and point out the things that He wants to lovingly, lovingly correct in you. We don't always like to be corrected. We don't always like to change. We don't always like to admit when we're wrong, right? Those are hard things. But honestly, sometimes we need that one-on-one -on -one time with him to lovingly point out those things in ourselves that need to be changed. And so it was really good timing too, I gotta tell you, because in the past like, couple weeks, I've had some of those hard conversations with God myself, like where I'm wrestling with him or where I'm like, ooh, like I felt convicted about something, but then, you know, you're trying to decide, well, is this just guilt and shame creeping in? Is that what I'm feeling? And, and the, there is a temptation for that, right? Like, when we're convicted, there's that temptation of, oh, now I have guilt and shame in my life, and so I should feel really bad. But that's not what God wants. That's not humility. <laughs> he wants us to take the things that he's telling us and convicting us and make a change. That's good. And so I had to have that, that conversation with him, and I shut off the guilt and shame. I said, all right, I just have to own this. I feel God is telling me to make a change in this area of my life, and I need to do it. And it's, it's funny, because once you finally give in, it's overwhelming peace. When we live in healthy humility under the authority of Jesus, we actually have more freedom. I know, it doesn't always make sense, but it's true. The Lord doesn't hide what he wants from us. The Bible tells us plainly, it's not just Jesus teaching this, like this wasn't a new concept, like, hey, I'm gonna teach you on humility. God had been trying to tell his people for a long time before that. I need you to be humble. I'm gonna tell you exactly what I want from you. If the prophet Micah says it, Micah 6, 8, he has shown you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Plain as day, there's our instructions. Plain as day. And it always feels like freedom and authority shouldn't go together, but they do. The more we submit to God's ways, the more we submit to what he requires of us, the more freedom we actually have in our lives. And it was Jesus that showed us how to truly live this out. You know, in the Old Testament, we just weren't getting it. God's like, humble yourself. Humble yourself. Please, I'm telling you, this is what I want. He, he sent Jesus to show us how to live it out. I mean, Philippians 2 even says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature, God did not consider equality with God, or did not consider with 
equality with God, something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. So this was Jesus. He modeled exactly the way we're supposed to be. And so just to kind of like be mindful and have a self-check because, you know, who doesn't like practical applications, we can look at the things that Jesus did and kind of decide for ourselves, are we walking this out? Some attributes that Jesus had that might help us know if we're living in humility and living in a humble life. One thing is gratitude. Gratitude is one of those. Are you a thankful person? Do you regularly think about things you are actually grateful for? Because practicing gratitude can actually be very humbling. Jesus was God's own son and gave thanks in all circumstances. All circumstances. I mean, think about it. When he performed miracles, when he had only a little bit of food, what was the first thing he did? He gave thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Father, for providing. And it was enough to feed 5,000 people. 5,000 plus. Being thankful for even little things can have a big impact in your life. Another thing is, do you put others first? Now, not in a, are you a doormat or don't have any boundaries kind of a way, because that's not healthy. We want to be healthy. Yeah. <laughs> so you should have boundaries. You don't need to let people walk all over you. But there are actually healthy ways that you can put others first in your life. Um, remember, again, last week Adam talked about Jesus healing a man on the Sabbath, right? Like, so that was the, the day of rest. Like, don't do any work. Jesus could have said, like, oh, no, I'm, I'm not going to heal you. But he's like, all right, clearly you need to be healed. I got time for that. It wasn't too much. I mean, and then being able to compromise uh, with people. Like, sometimes we have to work on, can we compromise? Can we come to an understanding? Like, that's a way to put others' needs first. Uh, being patient with people is a way to put others first. Mm. Like, you might not think of it, but it's true. Like, can I practice patience? Believing that a win for someone else is not your loss. Right. That's a, that's a big one. A win for somebody else is not your loss. Now, it might seem like it, right? Because, hey, if I'm up for a job promotion and someone else gets it, that might feel like a loss. If my favorite sports team goes to the championship but then loses the championship game, that feels like a loss. And maybe it is in the moment. Maybe, you know, it's like a moment of loss. But it's room for God to come in and move in your life. Yeah. It's dependency on Him. What if it's just not your turn? What if it's just not your moment? Because that happens. Yeah. What if you stop and recognize, you know, like, Hey, it's, it's your, my favorite sports team. Like, maybe they didn't win, but look how far they've come. Look how well they played this season. You know, maybe I wanted that promotion, but maybe God has something better for me later or something fit better for me. That's right. So it may feel like a loss, but anytime you have what looks like a loss in your life, it's also an opportunity for God to move. Yeah. All right. Can you admit when you're wrong? Can you take criticism? This is important. I should say constructive criticism and knowing the difference, right? Like, we want to be so in tune to our God-given identities that if someone comes to us, we want to be able to reflect. Is that person coming from a place of love? Are they telling me something that, like, God is trying to convict me of? Or are they just being harsh or they have their own issues? Like, we need to be able to filter that through the Holy Spirit and not be offended. Jesus was confident in who he was, right? Yeah. You might be like, that's easy. <laughs> But he was confident in his place in the with the Father. And he let the criticism of the Pharisees roll off his back. Because he knew, like, you know, they were not bored with him. But he was okay with that. Because he came to change things. He could see their, where their criticism was coming from. Jesus taught us the importance of repentance. Right? Understanding that when we do something wrong, we own it. Yeah. Whether it's wrong against God or wrong against man. Yeah. All right, can you ask for help when needed? That's another important one. <laughs> Asking for help, right? Being humble means being reliant. We're relying on God. This is important because, you know, we like to do things on our own. A lot of us don't like to ask for help. Healthy humility means full reliance on Jesus. Yes. Jesus was fully reliant on God. He was one with the Father. He took his, <laughs> you know, like before he died on the cross, 
he went to the garden to pray. He had his friends, he brought his friends and said, come with me, I'm gonna go pray. You stay here and keep watch. He, knew, he wanted to bring friends along. I'm gonna rely on my people to be with me while I rely on God to get me through this. He said, stay, keep watching me. And he went to pray. Sometimes you need to bring people along with you to pray with what's going on. All right, and maybe you just need to reach out to a friend sometimes for help. It's okay. Ask someone to pray for you. All right, and a few other things. Accept recognition gracefully. Because recognition is not a bad thing as we've talked about today. Like, we can be graceful in our recognition. Jesus was. People, you know, his fame grew. They were crowding around him. Um, you know, like he was going on a donkey. They were laying palm branches in his path. Like, he had a crowd of people around him. Some woman snuck up. She just wanted to touch him. She just knew she could be healed. He didn't get mad. He didn't get arrogant. Like, oh, you should not touch me. I'm kind of a big deal. He was like, all right, let's do this. You've got faith. You can accept recognition gracefully. And, you know, just to kind of like go with this, like, let's, let's make sure that we know that being humble is not the low self-esteem or the putting, you know, ourselves down. Like, that's not helpful. That's not something that Jesus did. He didn't downplay his miracles. He didn't downplay his ministry. We don't have to do that. I mean, that one was always a struggle for me. Low self-esteem is kind of a thing. Like, that you can really struggle with it. You get in this thought spirals of, you know, oh, if I just put myself down, then I got nowhere to go but up, right? That's not... We don't want to do that. <laughs> That's not healthy. Um, if you're putting others down const constantly, like we don't need to do that either. We don't have to put others down to make ourselves look better. Jesus definitely had his frustrations with people, but he was always loving and caring and never, um, you know, always knew how to talk to them. Comparing ourselves to others as greater or less than. Like, we don't want to do that. That's not something Jesus you know, like he just said, this is who I am. He owned who he was, right? That's what we're supposed to do. Not go, oh, well, that person is this or not this. We don't want to do that. Abusing a position of authority to make other people feel less than. We don't want to use our position of authority for our own gain, no matter what that means. Good leadership means pushing people up, yes. building people up, helping them see their God-given identities and abilities. And Jesus showed his disciples how to do ministry like this. I mean, he made sure that they knew, this doesn't end with me. You go. You can do greater things in my name. Go. Do more. It doesn't end with me. <coughs> and that's what the leadership is all about. And so, that's a lot of lists and a lot of things I know. <laughs> but this is, this is all part of it. The good news is, whenever we lose our way, God calls us back into repentance with him. His goal is always going to be to be one with us. He always wants to be one with us. So no matter how many times his people rebel, you know, in the Old Testament it talks a lot about that people rebel, he always called them back to him. He always wanted to continue the relationship with them. In 2 Chronicles 7.14 it says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. All he wants is to be in relationship with us. All he wants is for us to have that healthy humility to submit to him, to partner with us. Because it's a better way. It's better than doing it on our own. Yeah. Healthy humility is full submission to God. And so, as we just wrap up today, I'm just going to invite everyone to stand up for a second. Plus, you probably all need to stretch now, too, right? I've been talking a while. Everybody needs to stretch. <laughs> we're going to stand, and we're just going to take a minute um, just to kind of think, you know, it is important to do a self-check. Where are we at today? What are the areas in your life that God is asking you to submit to him? Where, where is he asking you to bend a little? Maybe, maybe you're like the Pharisees. Maybe you struggle with needing the recognition and the status and, you know, the wealth or the power. Like, maybe that's something that you strive for because you think that's going to help you in life. 
maybe you just need to humble yourself because you're going through a tough time but you don't want to ask for help. You don't want to rely on people. Maybe you've been hurt and it's hard to reach out. It's hard to partner with others. But healthy humility is asking for help. Um, even just asking for prayer. Maybe you need to humble yourself before the Lord today. Maybe it's a personal, it's a hard conversation where he's saying, there's this thing in your life that's getting in the way. And maybe you need to confess your sins. Maybe he's calling you into repentance. Whatever it is, I just want everyone to close your eyes. Just close your eyes and sit with the Lord for a minute. invite you to come and seek prayer or seek prayer around you. 